The owner of this vehicle believes it was a Saxon Martin race car. What? I don't see any signs of it telling me that it's a Saxon Martin car. Saxon Martin colors were white with a blue top. It definitely doesn't have any signs of it being a race car. He says he's got a photograph of the car. Showing the, the VIN shaker. number and the car. I still am optimistic that the car is very much could be a, a Saxon Martin car. When you're trying to prove something out of the norm, you need to submit proof. Because it's happy and joyous, it's out of the ordinary for you. There's nothing here that even makes you think it's a Saxon Martin. No, 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 we're, we're past the point of race car. Could I'd be, something. be thrilled to know that this was a Sox and Martin race happy. car. Yes, I don't believe you would. We're just now moving in the 1970 Hemi Cuda that came to us from Long Island, New York a couple months ago. Uh, there's no engine or transmission. The guy is rounding up date coded ones to go in the car. The car is a very rare, very original Hemi Cuda. Shaker hood, white car with a painted blue roof, painted blue body panel, and lots and lots of questions for Tony. Mark said there's something else about the car that might be somewhat controversial or not as far as what the car is or not. He hasn't let me in on that yet, but I'd like to hear about it. I'd like to dive into it. Okay, so I got some good questions for you on this one. Folks, a few years ago, Tony D'Agostino and I shot one of the very first things in this building that we ever shot, and it was the validation of a 1970 Hemi Cuda. This Hemi Cuda is the blue painted roof car, white body, 426 Hemi Cuda that you just saw a few episodes ago. We promised you would come back and revisit this. This is how we're doing it. We're showing you eight-year-old footage in the moment where Tony and I validate whether this car is a St. Louis Blues promotional car or a Sox and Martin Cuda, or whether or not it's just an old-fashioned 426 six Hemi. Is that true? That is absolutely true. And so we want to welcome you to watching some older footage. Tony was slimmer. I was heavier. That's okay. Things happen. You were... Hey, no, hey. No, I'm, I'm, you've hey. lost some weight since then too. Oh, right? yeah. That's yeah. fair to say. Oh, very fair. Okay. Yeah. Normally speaking, when you watch Graveyard Cars, you'll see a nice lit interview to go along and kind of drive the episode. So and so drops a wheel out in the shop, you cut to me saying, why is the idiot dropping it? Do you know how much these things cost? So it's just a way to drive it. We're not doing that this episode. Can you tell everybody why? Absolutely. It's because Tony isn't here to defend himself. Tony isn't here to defend himself. That's we shot this thing eight years ago. Tony lives in Delaware. It's it's not easy for him to just jump on an Why airplane. Why would Tony and come need to here? defend himself? I don't well, do anything in a lit interview that should box him into a. <laughs> uh, this antiquated footage comes to you without present day lit interviews in its rawest form. We've never done this before. Mm -hmm. Apparently I can't be trusted to be fair and objective when somebody's not here to defend themselves. So if that's the case, raise the curtain, dim the lights, right? I don't know, what was the line? I, I'm... Yeah, never watch. No, what's the reference? Bugs. I'm missing it. Oh, it's Bugs Bunny. Okay. I used to watch Bugs Bunny. Not a lot. Explains a lot. Yeah. The car is a 1970 Hemi Cuda. All Hemi Cudas came standard with shaker hoods, which it has. First question for you, I already know the answer. Make sure you do. 70 Hemi Cudas, were they all shakers? Every Hemi Cuda had a shaker. Obviously, from a first glance, the, the shaker bubble's missing, and what holds up the shaker bubble would be the Hemi engine, and there's no Hemi engine in it right now either. 446 barrel 70 Cuda didn't oh. have a shaker. Optional. 71. Optional. Very good. It was standard only on the Hemi Cuda. Fender tag's not on the car. I believe the owner might have that. I think that. the owner has that and the build sheet still. Right. Let's look at the VIN real quick. What we're looking for here is to confirm that it really is a, a Hemi Cuda VIN number on the car, which is a BS23ROB, which decodes to B is the Barracuda body line. S is the special price range, which is, quote, for, is the Cuda the model. Hard group. Yep. The Cuda model, right? 23 is a two-door hardtop. R is the 426 Hemi. O is the model year, 1970. And B is? Hamtramck, Michigan. This is the hole right here that accepts the grommet, that accepts the cable for the shaker. A shaker hood bubble has air doors in the front of it that are manually operated. All you have to do is pull a lever that says fresh air. Car bear. Car bear. Car bear. Car bear. See, he's spoiled. His parents gave him all this stuff. I didn't have any of it. I never had a Hemi Cuda. I can beat him on codes nine out of 10. I, like a, I beat him like a, a rented mule. How many Hemi cars did your folks give you by the time you were 15? Even if Tony's parents had given him a Hemi Cuda when he was a kid, it would not be an excuse as to why Mark doesn't know the correct phrase on the shaker handle. Zero. Okay, same as me. So <laughs> we had, I had a 3 degree Roadrunner. <laughs> Did you? Still have it. I bet you worked hard for it, though. Yeah, it was a $500 car in 1977. Gosh. 
Convertible Roadrunner 70, 383 automatic on the column. Four speed, console. The windows. $500. It was rusty, 1977, second gas crisis, wasn't worth much. First glance, you could tell that obviously the, the shaker bubble's missing, and underneath that, the Hemi's missing. Besides that, there's some interior parts that are out of the car, but we haven't gotten into it real deep yet. As you've learned in the past, it would be fairly easy to take a core support out of a real Hemi Cuda and put it in a 318 Barracuda and call it a real car when it, in fact, was a rebody. So we're looking to validate those things. The things that you do see in the books are some of the things you don't see in the books. There's things in our heads you'll never read in a book. So my first question would be, when you take a look at that hood right there, is that an original or an aftermarket hood? It's an original it, hood, and it's an early hood without the Is it a 70 rates. or 71 hood? It's an early 70 hood. Prior to? January 1st stamping. There's no crush zones here, federally mandated crush zones about here and about here that came in after as a rolling stock, because he's got a car that was built in February of 1970 and still had no crush zones. So they were rolling the stock over there. They were changing it. But theoretically, they weren't supposed to be making any more cars without Any more hoods. Zones. Any more hoods. Believe, they built the cars. Right. They weren't going to stop making cars. Yes. They, okay. They're not going to throw away the hoods. Right. It was a running change, like you said, during the course of the model. They had year. 100 hoods, 200 hoods, 300 hoods, 1,000 hoods. Are you going to throw them away because they don't have the crush Use zones? Use them today with depleted. And that also goes to show you that they were probably, and I'm pretty confident of this, but probably never, ever serviced without the crush ribs. So if you went into Chrysler right. in 1971. Even in 1970, you couldn't have gone in early enough to get one without the crush. Right. Yep. This is really hard because it's rusted, but this stuff right here is all very factory type of stuff. It's the same color and consistency. That was a product that was put on that laid between two panels that allowed them to have adhesion to each other as well as absorb any kind of a shock as they're driving down the road. That stuff is all intact. The original spot wells, which probably won't show up very well, but yet I can feel right, right. here. You'd have to clean the off through. the rust and put some paint or you primer would. on. I'm sure it'd show up. But the rest of the stuff on it that I don't always see on an aftermarket, because there's a few companies making them, a lot of times this rib right here, Tony, isn't there. Okay. It's just flat around there. But this right. is the stamp. You know, that was made as a stamp. Do you know how to tell an original shaker decal is compared to a reproduction? The original ones are foil backed. Let me peel this away oh, here. Oh, actual silver. Silver foil. You see that? Oh, yeah. See the shininess below my thumb? Recently, Mark and Tony discovered that the correct shaker hood decal with a foil back is being made by Performance Car Graphics, which is now owned by Mike Mancini from Instrument Specialties. So that in itself right there tells you that that hood's an original shaker hood because you couldn't take that off without destroying it. Well, or at least original decal was put on it. At yeah. Some point. But most likely looking at the condition of the hood, this looks like it's been this way an awful long time. An awful long time. You know, I'm a pessimist. I don't believe anything, so I need to be convinced. I don't see the correct Hemi power brake booster here. Well, first of all, that decal wasn't on a 1970 model car. That's 71 stuff. Well, the Mopar was red, white, and blue Mopar. It didn't come out till late 72. Yeah, so the 45 is completely off, at least the 72, 73 model. Right. So what is missing is the very crucial correct one, the correct power brake booster for the 426 Hemi 70 Cuda. Okay. Uh, another thing I see is uh, a V8 K frame. Uh, yeah, it's not a Hemi. Somebody's K changed frame. that K member out. Of course, the Hemi's a V8, but this is a non-Hemi K frame. And it's in the back seat, just so you know. <laughs> okay, cool. And I don't know if it was an original power steering car, but here's an interesting point. That's a manual steering gear for sure. Mm -hmm. Were all 426 Hemi 1970 Cudas power steering? No. No. Oh, no. That's right. There was oh, some arm that was steering an by Armstrong. Yep. So we'll have to take a look at the build sheet when we're done. And Looks like the original cooler. Is that correct? I'm not sure that. Um, you knew they used a cooler. You're just not sure that's the cooler. Right. The Street Hemi automatic cars had a transmission cooler for extra cooling which no other regular car came with. I believe a taxi did, a police car may have, mm -hmm. like that, a heavy duty fleet yeah. type car, but not as, our muscle cars don't. They, they used the cooling. radiators. They yes. cooled it through the bottom of the radiator. And they also tank. used, That's right. this was used in addition to the cooler in the lower radiator. It went in and out of the lower radiator and then went into Oh, the it did go through both? Yes. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. You know it's a real BS23 R0B car you were looking at the VIN earlier, right? Correct. Okay, no, it's a D32 automatic, right? Correct. Some of the things we don't know because we don't have the build sheet is whether it's power steering, blah, blah, blah. Well, the manual's in there. Very, yeah, it's also the wrong K-member. Right. And it right. Right. to it. Tony would like to point out, and I'm quoting, I knew that there was a non-Hemi K-member. That there was a test for Mark. Also, that he could see the Hemi K-frame was in the back of the car. The owner of this vehicle believes it was a Sox and Martin race car. What? Mark would like to point out and submit for evidence the insane look Tony has on his face at this moment. And he believes it's an involuntary defense mechanism because Tony knows he misspoke about the K-members. 
the owner of the vehicle. Well, the owner of the vehicle told me that he believes that this was one of the cars that were built for Sox and Martin back in 1970. And he's basing that on the fact that Sox and Martin colors were white with the blue top. Okay. He says he's got a photograph of the car. Showing the the VIN number and the car at the same time. Okay, I want you to look at this car and I want you to think as we're going around this car, if this R- is the race front. car, you, race car, you said. Yeah, race car. Talks Martin race car, right? Okay. Right. Okay. Hmm. I didn't think they need wipers in a race car. That's, that's, <laughs> that's good. Horns too, you know. It's, uh, even it has a heater. Okay. Once again, Mark would like to point out the uncontrollably wild, fiercely felicitous eyes on Tony as he begins to debunk the hope that this could be a Sox and Martin race car. Heater? What, what are you racing in the winter? It isn't a race car today. Okay, it was a race car back in the day. That's. The most negative human being, you and Royal ought to get together. You just immediately do it. You know why? Because it challenges you. You hate it. You hate the idea that this guy's got one. Well, I doubt very much. Did the manufacturer put the coil mounting bracket on the right hand apron? Or is that something you might oh, see oh, a little more often? Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Sox and Martin used a factory coil that would have fit right in there and put it right there. Did Sox and Martin put the wrong horn on it? That's the wrong horn. Okay. It should be a high end and low note horn. Right. That's an NHRA horn. Why? It's what does it say? Ready, set, go? I'm just saying. Work with me here. Convince me, man. Power disc brakes. What does that tell you? What kind of an axle package does it have to have a power disc brakes? Does it have to have an axle package? No, you could have ordered power disc brakes. I believe you could have without an A32. Right. Or an A33, but you would have got them with an A34. Is that correct? A, right, A34 would be the automatic deal, but you would also get a Dana, I believe. You would have got a Dana. Just, just have it, I haven't been speed. underneath this. I, I haven't been on There's another thing. Yet. You just said, we were saying four speed. What was Ronnie Sox known as? Ronnie Sox of Sox and Martin was indeed known as Mr. Four Speed, so it wouldn't make sense for this car to be an automatic. If it was built as an original Sox and Martin car, Tony's eyes in this case would be correct. Mr. Four Speed. Okay, thank you. Is every Sox and Martin car a four speed? That I don't honestly know. I know you're more into the race stuff, and I will give you that. But I'm just telling you, I like to believe, I like to take people at their word because. I'm a decent human being. and, and I'm I, not saying that the owner is lying at all, but when you want to believe could something, be he could be misled and, and wanting to believe something. So we can fabricate things, I agree. So he's not trying to disprove it. He's wanting right, to believe right. it. Right, right. Okay. And it's easier when you're wanting to prove something than disprove it. Okay. Right. All right. I haven't looked at any of it. Can you look at the VIN on the tie bar and just make sure that that's... Yes, sir. We have uh, B... Okay. Zero. Okay. For you, zero. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, whatever. 146. Eat a salad. 483. Okay. All right, what's the VIN say? 146, 483. Okay. And I'm looking at the spot welds along here. Even though this car's got paint built up on it, there's this factory spot weld there, 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 there. Those are difficult to duplicate and certainly as old and as antiquated as the paint is on this car, it wasn't done any time recently. So if somebody was faking something, they would have faked it in 71 or two, and what would the point have been? You bought a 70 Roadrunner with three to three and a four speed for 500 bucks. Right. Here, um, just a- Upper cowl? Yep, yeah, we have the correct number here, B0. Uh-huh. One, four, six, four, eight, three. Yep. So, so far I'm convinced it's a 70 Hemi Cuda. Because the R that doesn't appear on these two numbers does appear in the vent of right. the car and they all match, And okay? we do have the 3 8 fuel line with the vapor return. Again, could have been 444 barrel or, or 446 barrel. barrel. But mm-hmm. th- this is jiving. Right. I don't see Ronnie socks yet, but I see a Hemi Cuda. I believe that I believe the uh, drilled hole in the firewall. It's stamped. It's, see, it's not, not drilled. When somebody's faking a car, they'll drill it. That's stamped with a tool. It has a guide hole drilled through it, two pieces, and it stamps. That won't cut your finger. A drilled hole will cut your finger. Our 1971 Cuda 446 barrel four speed. Dana Trackback EV2 Tour Red Shaker Hood N96 car. Guaranteed to blow your mind, 100% real live car, shaker car. Got the original fender tag for it. That hole was drilled. Drilled. Unless there is any way that the tool you're talking about, because I've never seen it, could leave slag on one side. Mark would like to point out that he believes, even to this day, that these holes came both ways. In some cases, it's evident they were drilled, and in other cases, there's no doubt they were stamped. Remember, folks, these were human beings responsible for making this hole. Because that was the thing. It left the slag that you're describing that you could cut yourself on, and it was like off-center off to one side. I mean, these are pretty well set and, and pretty sanitary holes. 
Okay, so overall, you would sign off on the underside of this car being at least a real Hemi Cuda, but you're not convinced it's a Sox and Martin car. No. There's nothing here that even makes you think it's a Sox and Martin car. I, I see the white body with the blue roof, because I know that that was, you know, typical of their colors. You know, they had red sides on the car. Of course, I couldn't see the factory doing that, but... We might be able to find some remnants of that if we, love, if we this, care to. I don't see any signs of red on the side of the car, but a race car. Yeah, it would have been red. It would have had stickers. It would... <laughs> I'm gonna throw them a couple of curveballs. Uh, every BS23 car that ever left the assembly plant was guaranteed, mandated a blacked out rear body panel with sporty, okay? This car doesn't have it, okay? There's only two cars in the world that didn't have a blacked out rear body panel with a BS23. One doesn't exist. The other one is a Sox and Martin car. All right, what one painted feature on every CUDA, regardless of the color, regardless of the options, regardless of the engine, as long as the second digit was an S, what painted feature came on it, guaranteed. The Organisol rear body panel. Take a look. There ain't no Sox and Martin signs on the car to me yet. Show me. I always look for the best in people. I always make people believe anything's possible. You know, I still am optimistic that the car is very much could be a, a Sox and Martin car. It's got a blue top, blue guts, and a blue rear body panel. All Cudas were supposed to have a blacked out rear body panel. The Sox and Martin cars did not. They were the blue. It turns out this statement is false. The St. Louis Blues cars had a white rear body panel, according to the only photographs that exist today. When you're trying to prove something out of the norm, you need to submit proof. Because it's happy and joyous, it's out of the ordinary for you. Because it could be I'd something... I'd be thrilled to know that this was a Sox and Martin race car. Yes! Stay tuned to see if Tony D'Agostino would really be happy to find out if this is a real St. Louis Blues Barracuda or Sox and Martin Cuda. Or if, as we suspect, he would be thrilled that it's neither. I'd be thrilled to know that this was a Sox and Martin race car. Yes! I don't believe you would. I believe you'd go home and you'd kick every one of your cars in the side and blame them all for not being a Sox and Martin race car. It'd be rare, it'd be cool. I, I'd get enthused about it. I love fun. Would it be worth any more as a Sox and Martin car? The oh, tons. Documented, real live Sox and Martin promo car from 1970, 426 semi automatic, shaker hood, they all were. Even if, it, even if it wasn't a race, Sox and Martin race car, if it was proven that it was given to Ronnie Sox and he drove the car, it was his personal car, absolutely. So why don't I get Ronnie Sox out here to look at the car? He passed away about 10 years ago. It turns out Ronnie Sox passed away April 22, 2006, nearly eight years before Mark invited him to be on the show. Insert foot in mouth. Let me show you the rear body panel, Cool Breeze. Where is it? Where's what? Where's the Organisol black rear body panel on a BS car? Oh, you know, you paint cars. They make paint every day. They do. They okay. Do. They do. I bet. They made paint before you. You know what else they don't make though? What? Oxidized paint. That is so weird. Mm -hmm. I can't call up and order a 40 year old looking can of paint. Right. I could probably have you paint and it would look like it was a 40 year old can. Right. <laughs> all I, I'm I, saying is, that. I want you to look at the original patina on this. Look at it all really closely and tell me what your thoughts are. I'm looking at a rear body panel that looks to me like it's been blue since the beginning of time. I, I'm gonna dispute that because there's two blues. This car has been painted. What Mark and Tony are looking at is the rear body panel paint. All e-body Cudas were to have an Organisol painted rear body panel. Since this car is definitely a real Hemi Cuda, the body panel should be black. I'm pretty oh, sure yeah. you agree. Yeah. The blue here is outside of the M88 rear body moldings. So it has been repainted, but I'm gonna be fair. There's two different color blues back here. Oh yeah, I see so that. So we're gonna say for the sake of argument that that was done by the second guy. And let's, let's still go with the idea that maybe this did come blue for Ronnie Sox. Okay. So we got to go back to old original paint. I do see what I believe to be original, old, older paint, blue paint that matches the roof under the emblem. Okay. But let's take it a step further. I knew we were coming here. I'm prepared. I want to remove this. Okay. And I'm not saying this is since definitive. Then, since we this, don't want to be on our knees, can we bring it back and raise it up in the air a little bit? and do this. Okay. I want to look inside the car before we okay. go out. Okay. Okay. I did that for Tony because he's kind of old and heavier. We do all that day one more time and I'm calling it all, all, all day, day. All day long, buddy. I'll give all you a hundred bucks to do it 10 more times. Show me. I don't have any money. Okay. Okay. What do you want to shoot? There's that power brake oh, poster. Tell me what you think of that. It looks like the right one to me. Again, 
I haven't spent my whole life around this stuff like you have. I do see the big studs that yep. I think you had mentioned to me before. Three-eight studs. We apologize for the terrible camera work and lighting in this scene. It was a long time ago, and the operator responsible has been sacked. It's got the big bracket goes inside. Yep, this is old and original. Yeah. It's got a light package, yeah, too. It does, cause, cause yeah. A lot of race cars you need to see in the trunk. Stay tuned to see Mark explain why a race car would need a trunk light. The blue guts all over the place. Got the original road lamp switch down here. That's a good sign. Cool. And it is a rally instrument car. Oh. Oh. What do you got? Oh. Maybe it wasn't a rally instrument cluster. Come around here. What's wrong with that picture? Oh, that's a... That's a 72 to 4 cluster, yeah. specifically 73 4. Yeah. Because the 72 would have had an 8,000 RPM tack. Yep. So that's 73 and 4. What was the last year that the reset knobs came out through the wood grain? 71. See, this is a 72 to 4 style cluster. Uh, we could tell that easily by the reset knob for the odometer, for the tripometer, is within the gauge. Whereas on the 70 and 71 rally dashes, it was off into the wood grain. Mark would like me to share his strong disappointment in the camera and lighting work as well. He had some choice words for our previous team that I won't be sharing with you. We're doing much better these days. Same for the, uh, the clock reset knob. It's within the gauge instead of in the wood grain bezel next to it. The tachometer goes to 7,000, which was only used in 73 and 74. And it also has the seatbelt warning light. Being this is an automatic on the floor, it has the slapstick shifter and indicator. Whereas we noted on the car we, we looked at the other day, it was a very early 1970 production that said shift gate as compared to slapstick that the vast majority of them say. And it does have the, the script spelled out Barracuda, which is 1970 only. In 71, they went to a rectangular emblem that was easily changed between Barracuda and Challenger. So that way they could use the same dash pad in a Barracuda and a Challenger without having to have a specific dash pad. So it was interchangeability. When I'm looking at a car to validate it, like Tony noticed, first of all, that rally dash isn't the original rally dash the car started life with. That's a 72 to 74, and more specific, 73 to 74. So we know it didn't start life in a 70. That makes us wonder, is the windshield washer reservoir underneath the hood supposed to be there or not supposed to be there? Because you automatically got power windshield washers with a rally dash. But we don't know this rally dash started life, if this car started life with a rally dash or if somebody just stole it over the years and stuck this one in there. If you didn't have a power windshield washers, then you would have had a foot pump that bolts to the floor. So I'm looking to see if the two holes that would have held the foot pump, if there's old remnants of that ever being on there and there are no evidence that it ever had one on there. That validates the fact that at the very least it was a variable speed dash. It doesn't validate whether or not it was a rally dash. The rear speaker fader, 70 I know for a fact. Was it still there in 71? Was it there in 72? Was it there in 73 and 74? See, that's where it would be located for the rally dash. It would be underneath the headlight switch panel if it was a standard dash. Because you wouldn't have that space there because that big 120 speed armor right, that's right. oversized would have been in that area. So it would have been up here, you mean? No, it would have been underneath there. Just Oh, like here. Exactly. I see. OK. The guys are talking about the road lamp switch located on the dash. In 1970, road lamps were part of the CUDA package, and if you had a rally instrument cluster, that road lamp switch would be fastened to the bottom of the cluster itself. If you had a standard instrument cluster, the switch was moved down underneath the dash on the left side of the steering column. So if they put this in here, they put everything in here. Right. They changed that panel, they, and it, they actually got one with that. And More than know, likely, it grew legs over the years, right? right. The original. That's, that headlight switch panel, I believe to be correct 70 vintage, uh, due to the fact it doesn't have the little picture of the, uh, uh, the later ones uh, got oh, to be have more. have the thing? No, they have a little picture of a, a, a headlight next to the headlight switch. They have a little picture of a wiper oh, going next to the. Oh, right. Yeah, you don't do a lot of restorations on the newer E-bodies. Right. So you're, right. Oh. But you, you know, you work on the good cars. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. So there's the shaker ring. Is that an original there? I don't believe this is an original Those are one. are long studs. No, right. No, it's not an original. It's a reproduction. And the studs, the original studs are very short. Uh, there may be half three, that or less. Three eighths, half inch. Yeah. Three eighths of an inch, half, half inch, very short. And these are far from original. And these nuts, is this what they used to? Or would it have been a captive washer flat type nut like you'd see it, on? This is the correct type. It is. Nut. Okay. All right. 
and it was painted on the hood. So an original paint car, if you remove the, uh, the shaker Stickering. trim ring, you'll have prime. Got it. You'll have prime underneath it. I see. Instead of okay. body color. Okay. Okay, yes, sir. let's roll it back. <laughs> I, mean, I thought Mark was helping too, bud. Well, I put the light away, you freak. You are watching an episode that was filmed nearly a decade ago on Tony's second visit to Graveyard Cars. Unarchived and nearly unadulterated, so you can witness two of the world's top Mopar experts in their zone. No, no. No, I'm not going to lash out at my friends now. Ready? Hit it. Do I think it's still a race car? First of all, I never said it was. Tony would like to point out, in his own words, that dare ain't true. He said that dare was a real Saxon Martin race car. He said that's what the owner said. You want to stop there? I'm not Lurch. Um, I think that the car... I haven't seen anything again yet that's definitive. Why is the original rally dash mission? Was it an original rally dash, dash car? Um, you know, there's things that make me wonder if somebody was racing it, maybe they took that stuff out for weight, right? So, and now they're just kind of piecing the car back together again. Maybe it was a promotional car. Maybe, maybe they gave it to him in 74. Maybe it was a leftover. I'm just messing with you. They never did that stuff. Tony probably doesn't know any better. Let's take that uh, rear license plate off there, pal. What we're looking for is, as Mark said earlier, all of the BS models, Buddhas, had a black organosol, which is a textured satinish black paint within the rear body panel area. And we're trying to see if we see any remnants of that because part of what was supposed to be the Sox and Martin packages, the rear body panel was blue. So we want to see if we see any traces of original black that would have been typical of every other Cuda made. So we're going to take the license plate bracket off and look for paint underneath that and see. Because usually people would rattle bomb something, they wouldn't go to the trouble of taking it apart. So the footprint underneath it would show the real color. Those are the original symbols. Okay, so here's the original symbol, which is good, but what's not good is it's painted blue and those would have went in after the fact. Right. So that kind of makes us wonder a little bit. So I'd like to see any signs. I mean, this is your job now to show me the, show me the black. Oh. What do we have here, maybe? Oh. Yeah. It was black at one time. I believe so. Yeah. You'll find more when you take the gas tank filler neck out. You know, you'll, you'll see under there. Do you think, though, is it possible? Because I know you're full of hatred, and, and, and now you're getting a little happy because you're finding things. Finding that the rear body panel has black paint under the blue is another nail in the coffin for any hope that this car was a real Sox and Martin race car. Take special note of the joy on Tony's face. Is it possible that every BS car, when it left the assembly line, was black, but then if it was going to be a, a St. Louis Blues or a Sox and Martin car, that they painted it blue again? It could have been done at the dealership. Sure, absolutely. I'm, I'll, I'll be fair. I'm open-minded. I just there's more evidence towards it not than being than being is. Yeah, that's the original Organisol black. You can see it's a nice suede type okay. of matte finish to it. You know that definitely has been on there for a while. Okay. Somebody probably just thought it was neat to make it match yeah. to the roof. Yeah. You're hitting bare metal there. Right. But I think there's black around it too. Yeah. Somebody and somebody. This would be an easy area to have sanded down to bare metal. That would be a more difficult area. And, most people are lazy and wouldn't do it. So right. they would just rattle bomb it. And that's the wrong blue anyway. That's not the B5 blue the top is. Okay. So the top's Doesn't that look like, okay. I, yeah, the top's EB5, the inside's B5 guts. And we and, got two here. It looks like a B3 and some yeah, kind of blue. Yeah, yeah, strange blue. Guess what I spy? An original set of mufflers. And Dana Varan. Oh, and a Dana, look at there, yeah. So it is the 834. Well, not that would no. be with a four speed, be 832. Wait, oh, it's 832, I would have asked, sorry. Yeah, no, you're fine. Between you and me, I think, I think it's kind of cute. Rubbing elbows with Should the Should I let dog. it down to on the uh, uh, stop? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it'd be great. In light of Mark's victory lap with the camera, 
I'd like to take this opportunity to point out the scales of correctness over the course of the whole episode weigh heavily in the favor of Mr. D'Agostino. Let's get a light and something to clean off the... Uh... We're talking about a real live Dana 60. However, I'm seeing things that are very race car inspired. Like... Well, thank you for asking, Tony. What's up with that? That's a bracket for a brake tee. Yeah. How, how does that go fast? Because you take the one off of the axle right here, it, which is made of brass, which weighs a ton, and you put this little steel one on. You've just lightened it up maybe a half of an ounce. I think this weighs more. Oh, the steel bracket weighs sorry, more. Sorry, Professor open. Gadget. I had no idea that you're a walking scale. That's good. How about the pinion snubber? It doesn't have a Socks and Martin pinion snubber. Now, do you know what a Socks and Martin pinion snubber is? Yes, it's the adjustable pinion snubber that was used uh, to help it get better traction. So what about the pinion snubber? I don't see it welded on there, the, the reinforcement. Remember, it's just a chunk of steel that's welded yeah. on. All Hemi optioned cars were designed to have an additional welded-in reinforcement plate on the floor where the pinion snubber would impact it under extreme torque. For some reason, this car has no evidence the additional reinforcement plate was ever installed. Yeah, it's, it's sort of triangulate, a, a triangular shape. Unless E-body's different, is it the, no, this is all part of the seatbelt reinforcement. Piece, right, and right? then there's another plate that's underneath there, that's, you know, that's right there, right where the pin is. But it's from. welded on there, and I don't see it. That's correct. I, I do not see it. No, you, you'd feel the ridge. Oh, for sure. They could have did use it, though. Oh, well, oh. okay. The, the rule of thumb on this, from what I've seen, it's personal experience. I had a 70 Hemi Charger one time, and it didn't have what we call the torque boxes for an arrear. Mm -hmm. It also didn't have that. If you're going to have part of it, you're going to have all of it. Yeah, either it's guy screwed up all the way or he didn't screw up at all. Right. But this does have the, the closed-in subframe connectors, and it has the plate reinforcement, it looks like, on both sides, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Hmm. So is this an exception to the rule that somebody did forget that one? This area right here that makes this opening, this is the subframe connector that would be correct with a 440 and larger engine. And if you see that plate in there, that's a reinforcement that also came with this. It was part of that reinforcement package. See the little oval hole, the round hole medallion in it? And you can see that it's an extra piece they added in there. There's one on both sides of that. So the rear end that's underneath it also, tell them about that. This is not an E-body Dana rear. My first indication was I saw these welds here that are definitely not typical of the factory. Yep. Uh, and there's also a, a drain plug that stopped being used in 1968 model year. It was the last year for the drain plug. So right there we know it's a B-body because... And it was probably done back in the day when all of it didn't matter much money-wise. They probably did it because it's narrower and they could have got a bigger tire under it. Um, also, E-body Dana rears are very rare. And very expensive. Well, back in the day, they weren't even that expensive. They were just rare. Okay. The B-body rears were so common. Any GTX with a 444 speed yeah, would have had a Dana. Yeah. Every Charge RT had it. I parted out plenty of cars in the 80s to get the Danas out of them because that was the one of the first valuable Mopar parts. Got it was it. the Dana rear ends. And I took apart a lot of B-body four-speed cars to get the Danas out of them. So what happened to the original one that started life with, or is it an A32 car? We don't even know if it's <laughs> a Dana car. Exactly. Right. I have no doubt it was a CUDA. Yeah. I'm, I agree that with that because when you look at the torque boxes, they're, the reinforcements, they're just old and been there 100 years. I see very old fuel lines. Were you so, saying the damper on these is bigger too on a Dana? The B-bodies is on huge the B -body, difference. But, it's more minute on the E-body. I believe this is the Dana type because it doesn't come to a distinct point. Right. Where 343, three cars. They come to an actual point? Yeah. I thought more, they were blunt. You have to have them next to each other. They're that close. Okay. You yeah, right. really got to have them next to each other. And is that a 10-inch or an 11-inch brake? There's no um, drums on it, so I can't tell, but it looks like a 10 inch if I had to guess. I'd almost think 11, because look, by the time you put the drum in here, you got nowhere else to go. By the time, you know, the drum's gonna stick yeah, on the outside. Yeah, that's true, so, right, right. I so mean, that would be maxed right there. So it's got 11 inch, which is standard on the, back in those days on the rear drums, but if it was a true. If it was a disc brake car. Disc brake car with a Dana, it would have had 10 inch. And you know, to know for sure, there is a number, it's got a lot of gobs of paint yeah. on it. After this segment, Mark found evidence that on the 1971 E and B body cars, they did have 11 inch rear drums with a factory disc brake setup. We don't know why this happened, because the broadcast sheet calls out 10 inch. But to date, we have five documented cases. Yeah, but you could that. decipher that number on the axle tube and it'll tell you everything. Torque boxes in the front are in place. Yes, they are. These here, 
match up with the ones in the back. When we talk about subframe connectors, there's ones in the rear and ones in the front. This extra plate that you see right here, that only came on cart on either a convertible of any engine, a 444 barrel, a 446 barrel, or a 426 Hemi. That's the only time you would have um, those. AAR. Fronts? A yeah, AAR. Oh, fronts too. ARs. And oh, I had a weird car. I had Sorry, a, you're right. Fronts uh, yeah. and rear? Yeah. I had a, but it doesn't have the reinforcements on the uh, leaf spring, ah, the plates. Sure. Um, I funny. even had one time, now this is, this goes into the weird, a 318 four-speed Barracuda that had front torque boxes, but no rears. 318 four-speed, nothing car other than that. It was plain no crazy rack, or inviolate. Mark has now documented 10 e-bodies that should not have received front or rear torque boxes, but did. Some just the front, others just the rear, but no documentation that front and rear were mistakenly installed. Uh, but, you know, who knows? Transmission number. Yeah, what do we got? Oh, it's a 69 out of a Hamtramck car. Right. Uh, so, you know how to tell if it's even out of a Hemi car or oh, not? Oh, sure. There, there's a PK number on the driver's side. But do you know uh, it just off the top of your head, though? Uh, I know it starts with 3410. I forget the last couple. But if I saw it, it might. It's a PK 289. OK. 2982-090. Yeah. 2701, that uses the 10,000-day yeah. calendar, right? <laughs> so I don't know what that is. Okay, this is a factory disc brake car, uh, 1970. Yep. And it's an early 1970 car, so it has three brake valves. Mm -hmm. It has your... As your main proportioning valve. Distribution. It's got the distribution valve, which is the one against the inner fender well. And oh, then oh, next yeah. to it, we have the metering valve. And then this was only used early through the model year. I believe sometime December, January at the latest, probably. They used this valve, which is what they consider the proportioning valve, which limits the fluid pressure and volume going to the rear because disc brakes require a higher volume and higher pressure because they're not self energy to the, to the right to the front brake calipers because they're not cut down the fluid to the back. So those are all distribution blocks up there. Distribution and metering. Yeah. As we're moving to the back, if and you look at the block. front leaf spring hanger, it's a little what I would call shallow or short, whereas the Challenger one's a little bit longer. Oh, sure, yeah, that's a long reach it's all the way back to here. And that's how you got the extra length in the wheelbase, because the floor pans are the that's same. Right here, here. Uh, this one right here. That's the one. It's two inches longer on a Challenger than okay. it is on a Cuda. The E-Body Barracuda carries a two-inch shorter wheelbase than the Challenger. The Barracuda is 108 inches, while the big sister Challenger is 110 inches. And this is how you get it in the wheel. Yeah, sure. Back. Yeah, that would make sense. Right. As we go and look at the leaf springs, the correct Hemi springs are 3400, 024, and 034. These are also the wrong lower shock nuts, in case you didn't know. That's an aftermarket suspension yeah, nut. Right. Not the original TriCastle. But they are that the, looks pretty close to yes, right. But they are the 70 E body drop down rear shock blades. So yeah. They drop it down lower. Actually, that nut's too thick. You know what I think that is? Yeah. Or U bolt nut. U bolt nut, yeah. We make these cars way better than they ever were at the factory. We make them better than we did when we were kids. We had no money. We didn't care about didn't that care. stuff. Look at this. I know the cars, it ain't its first rodeo. I know, but look how they nice never, that they, nope. they never fit perfect. Tight at the top, wide at the bottom. This side's been blasted, so you can't even count it. But right. I don't think they were great. I just don't. No, they... So your overall consensus is real life 426 Hemi automatic, real Hemi Cuda, which is great. I'm 95%. Mark wants me to point out that he believes Tony is 100% sure it's a real Hemi Cuda, but wants that 5% buffer in case he misses something. He mentions this as more evidence of Tony's psychopathy. Okay. Know, my only little doubt is, is that snubber plate, but I'm very well convinced. The original heat shields are still in place, which is mandatory for the dual exhaust systems. Right. and. One thing that's more important than that is this bracket. This is what people would forget sometimes right. when they're trying to clone a car. This is for the left side exhaust, which only came on the dual exhaust cars, right. where every car had to pass inside right. for single exhaust. And only your performance models had dual exhaust. Correct. Even a 3 to 3 2 barrel with single exhaust. Right. Yeah, even though I had the HP manifold on it. On the left side. Yeah. Yeah, there's your 3 8 main line. There's your quarter inch vapor return line. I run along the right-hand side rail all the way up to the front and then go into the vapor fuel vapor separator and over to the fuel pump. These brackets here are only for bucket seat cars. Correct. If you had a bench seat, you only use the outers. Right. But on bucket seat cars, they put these inner support brackets in 
So that way, when you get thin guys like me sitting in there, we don't break through the floor. Mark would also like to point out that this statement by Tony is not true. The seat reinforcement plates prevented the nuts from pulling through the floor on acceleration. They had nothing to do with how many sandwiches one may or may not have consumed in one's lifetime. Although less probably doesn't hurt. So it's fair to say it was a bucket seat car, right? Yes. Okay, yep. so it's also fair to say it was probably a race car. I'm just saying that how many race cars had bench seats in them, right? It's a bucket seat car, torsion, Hemi, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> ah, boy. Okay, bottom line, what you thought? Real Hemi Cuda. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty confident it's real Hemi can't say for sure it's Can't say for sure it's not a Ronnie Sox car. I don't, I don't see any indication. There's no evidence It was it ever is. a race car. Yeah, I don't and see anything like I that don't either. get a connection. I, I, besides the blue roof, that's the, it. The, right, which just and that was a, optional on a six-cylinder car. Right. The two-toned painted blue roof is the only thing this car has in common with the St. Louis Blues or the Sox and Martin cars. Unfortunately, this car shares none of the DNA markers of those cars. Yeah. You know, it's an oddball deal. Yeah. But people always like to attach themselves to some kind of stigma. It's true. Yeah. And uh, every cool orange '68 charger is a, is a is a bingo charger, <laughs> right. right? So you know. Okay. Oh, well, good job, man. Cool. Good job. I'm gonna uh, go up front. Hopefully, take a look at the broadcast sheet. Find out if it is what it's supposed to be. If everything's on it, my my main questions are the ones we had right there. Was it a power steering car? Okay. Right? Was it a disc brake car? We know that that uh, shut the rally gauges. Out. Rally gauges, exactly. Well, thanks, bro. I appreciate you coming out, man. That's cool. I mean, I know, <laughs> I know it ain't cheap, but you know, I'm rich now, so I don't have to worry about that. I enjoyed it. I always enjoy it. Besides going to a car show, you never get to see this many more cars in one place. And a lot it's of it's really crazy you now, isn't it? And there's a lot of cool cars here too. I mean, yeah. a lot of rare, rare, low production. I mean, single digit cars yeah. are here. Talk about again. I enjoy doing this. Mark and Tony are like Ralph Wolf and Sam Sheepdog. When they're not at work, they're the best of friends. They truly are, and they genuinely enjoy each other's company. But once they clock in for work, it's go time. Sometimes they're like two peas in a pod. First question. Your eyes are narrower than would, they were last time. Would you here. like to buy a bridge? I have one for sale. Don't need a bridge. Mark wants to believe it's special. There's something different. There's something unique and special. Buying this story, we might as well buy a bridge. No, I don't see why. <laughs> yeah. He's full of negativity. I'm full of positivity, OK? I still believe in Santa Claus, all right? Other times, it's East Coast versus West Coast. Weird stuff out here in Oregon. A classic skeptic versus a hope-filled dreamer. I heard there was a 70 Barracuda that came with a super bird wing. Prove it wrong. You can't prove something that didn't exist. Yeah, you can. You could stand on top of the tallest mountain you know and, have it? and yell that fire shoots out of your nipples. It doesn't mean it happened. I don't let my ego write checks that my body can't cash. You can prove it didn't happen because there's absolutely no proof of it happening. That by, by nature, by osmosis, I'll use smaller words, that just by default, if you will go that big of a word, makes it positive, makes it the fact that reinforces it. But contrast makes life interesting. I'm just an optimistic type of person, and, and if Tony said any different, then he should be taken out back and flogged. I ain't convinced. We don't have to prove that it's Friday today. I don't believe We don't have to prove that the sun is out. But we, when, you, when you're trying to tell me that it's Wednesday and we know it's Friday, you have to prove that. And what they share in common is what we all share in common. Or you, well, why is the burden of proof on me? Because you're, you're trying to prove something that's abnormal, that's out of the ordinary. I'm, I got that like orange aura around me and he's just got a black silhouette behind him. Who gives two hoots? We're just here for the cars.